Welcome into the Bro Four Squad podcast review of the Last Dance finale episodes nine and ten. I'm Matt Geiger along with Jeff Hornacek. Brian Banner is not here. His absence is not excused, and he has brought dishonor to the pod. Grading this on our five criteria: cast, story, best scene, impacts on pop culture, and rewatchability. So let's throw it to the mayor himself, Jeff Hornacek, who makes a brief appearance for the cast. Before we get started, Matt, I just want to say that we've done reviews on all the episodes of this. I've been completely honest every episode, and you have portrayed me in a fair light. But when it comes out and I see how stupid I sound, I'm going to claim that I hate the documentary. Okay. For the podcast, just okay. so you know. Okay. All right. okay? Even okay. though I've told the truth the whole time and you have edited it properly. Okay. okay. All right. Acting cast. So... I actually have a, a few notes here from Ronnie Cycler, legal counsel, that he wanted me to discuss. And I'm interested to see how you respond he to this. couldn't be here because he's wrestling with the NWO right now. So, <laughs> Right. He has a chair and Diamond Dallas Page is getting knocked in the like fourth and fifth vertebrae. So someone that – and again, one thing about this review, Matt, that I know you and I are excited to talk about. So the whole series, we've been kind of withholding judgment on certain things, saying, well – We'll see how they cover it the rest of the series, right? Like, we don't want to speak okay, about this yeah. now. Hey, the fucking free ride is over. <laughs> it All ends right? here. So if you didn't cover something properly the way I feel like you should have, now we're going to pass judgment. Tony Kukoc. A lot of people think that he was the second best player on that 97-98 Bulls team. Mm -hmm. And I have a few stats related to him and Pippen, but whether he was or not – he is completely glossed over, right? Yep. Like that whole season, he's not talked about at all. The only thing they talk about him is how he motivated them when they played against him on the Dream Team. Which it didn't matter because they're going to win anyway. Right. As we've learned through this documentary, Jordan would make up things to motivate him. So Kukoc averaged 13 points, 5 rebounds, and 5 assists in 30 minutes a game. Pippen averaged 19, 4, and 4 in 37 minutes a game, and he took two more shots than Kukoc. Okay. So at worst, they're equal players, and Kukoc is never talked about, really. The one last thing I want to say for acting and cast, Horace Grant, this is going to be kind of a theme tonight, uh, players that have now got to see the whole documentary have come out and said that they do not like the way they were portrayed. Horace Grant said on an ESPN interview this week, uh, he refuted that he leaked the Jordan rules to Sam Smith and called Jordan a snitch for the story about Coke and girls in the hotel room his rookie year and says that Jordan has cut off his friends if they say anything bad about him and cites that him and Charles Barkley have not spoken in four years since Barkley criticized the way he was running the Hornets. <laughs> so that's really. What, yeah. OK, I did. I thought they were still pretty close. That's a great I, Horns fun fact in a review, boys and girls, yeah. not the movie comedy. And, you know, I'm with you because I thought that was the case. And then I tried to think, like, Charles doesn't joke about him on Inside the NBA really anymore. No. And I really haven't seen him together anywhere. No, after the whole Ty Tiger Vegas, like, hooker thing, uh, that that boys group kind of split. Still, like, my dream for him to play in golf. I think that's Thurman's, too, is Tiger... Barkley, Jordan, and me playing at Valley High in Vegas. Uh, that would be fucking amazing. All right. For my cast, first off, I'm going to talk about people who didn't like this. I didn't read this full article, but apparently Pippin is not too big a fan of yeah. this documentary, which I don't blame him. It makes him look extremely bad. <laughs> it makes him look... I always thought, listen, the bad boys Pistons made anyone look soft, let's be honest, but the migraine game... When Jordan just kind of rolled his eyes, like, yeah, it was the migraine. Game. Like, Scotty couldn't play through a fucking migraine. And Scotty's like, I couldn't see. And then Scotty's back hurt, which, honestly, watching tapes of that, if you ever had a bad back, you can't run or jump. And his back was visibly hurting, because there was a well, couple of times he was walking, and I've seen someone with a bad back, and he, he did have a fucked up back, for sure. Uh, see, I agree with you about the migraine game. I actually think the way they portrayed the back thing, they actually made him look kind of like a hero. Like, he's clearly hobbling up and down the court see, every time out he's getting worked on in the locker room. See, I was almost pressuring myself to be like, okay, he's not soft for this. But after the way they portrayed him the whole game and how Jordan basically, like, 
hey, I had to take Scotty and be like, hey, man, don't cry when the bad boys do it. Like, you know, don't say anything. It, they just made Scotty look so soft the entire fucking documentary. By the time it was that, like, oh, his back hurt? Of course his back hurt. Whenever the, I, I don't really blame him for not enjoying this, but honestly, man, Pippen's been in a bad spot his whole career. Uh, at the end of this, they said he got traded. Was that to the Trailblazers or to the Rockets? Yeah, so this is kind of a correction from last week. So he did get traded uh, before his contract expired to Houston. Okay. Then after that season or season and a half, he signed that big free agent deal with Portland. Yeah, because he went with the Rockets, and it was Barkley also went with the Rockets, and it was Hakeem, Drexler, I think Mario Eli, uh Pippen, was and Was Sam Cassell on Barkley. that team? Uh, probably, and that was the pinstripe like cartoon rocket jerseys where the court that, had honestly, like thought, the, the animation of the yeah, rocket. Like those I, I thought those are pretty fucking cool. Lastly for Cass, I'm just going to take Jordan. I, <laughs> mostly they say this is a puff piece about Jordan, which I agree and disagree for one. Jordan comes out of this looking like an insane prick that just can't take a joke when somebody, I mean, these players fuck with each other all the time. And when, like, Byron Russell comes up and playing baseball, oh, did you quit because you know I couldn't guard you? That's a joke, and he, like, took it so seriously. He held the grudge for, like, six years. It was He came out of this looking bad, but I'm going to say something about Jordan. I love Michael Jordan in this, and this is why. He has his brand, but he's not an announcer. He's not, like, a spokesperson for anything. So he really doesn't give a fuck what anyone thinks about him. And put anyone else in this. Say this is LeBron in 20 years, Jeff. Do you think LeBron would be as big a prick on camera and let some of this behind-the-scenes thing where Jordan is just treating the media like absolute shit? LeBron would want you to think that he's like holier and holy. Jordan's not like this at all. You think he's an asshole coming out of this. And when he's on camera, he acts like an asshole and he just doesn't give a fuck. And I enjoyed it. He was real in this. I don't know if you like him or hate him, but he was definitely real. And Matt, to your point, someone, I can't remember where I saw this, but this is tying perfectly the Jordan-LeBron comparison. Jordan played at the perfect time where the media was big enough to make him like a worldwide phenomenon, and he could be known internationally, but he could also maintain his image because there wasn't the social media bullshit yeah. that like LeBron has to do, you know? Which like we'll he didn't do yeah. here in a second, probably. But all right, right into the story. So basically, this is 97, 98. They get into the Pacer series, which I love. Did that we all forget was, Larry Bird was the coach? Dude, that team was filthy. I didn't I didn't realize how many good players they had. I forgot Mullins, about Rose, the, uh, the Davis brothers. The, uh, the Davis brothers, who weren't really brothers, but they're just last name of Davis, I believe. Um, Rick Schmitz was very good. And, dude, what – I mean, Indiana. Just think. I mean, they're a basketball fucking state. Rick Schmitz and uh, number 17, the – what went the crew cut? Muller or whoever? Mo not Mullins. He was bald. Mullins. Yeah, Mullins. He was I on mean, the dream team. Mullins was. Bald. Yeah, but that's just an Indiana-type basketball player. And then you have fucking Larry Bird, basically the king of Indiana. Went to Indiana State coaching that team. I, I totally forgot Larry Bird coached. And that was awesome to see him and Jordan interact after the games when Bird actually played with Jordan. And Dude. what's your thought? What's your thoughts on Bird's coaching? I always thought he was kind of a good coach because he led that team to Eastern Conference Finals a couple of times. Oh, yeah, I think he was a good coach. I just don't think he enjoyed it that much. Okay. I also love how Jordan's way of saying congratulations to someone is he walks up to Larry Bird after the game and goes, fuck you, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dude, can you just for one time be like, hell of a and series, bro, man. And, and then he said, go work on your yeah. golf swing. You have time now. That's God, what fucking like, Jordan said to And him. Larry Bird's like, dude, okay, and just like walks away. What I love like, about the story is the playoff atmosphere was so great in the 90s. I mean, for one – Indiana is a fucking raucous place, and you got to see that a little bit when uh, LeBron was with the Heat when uh, they when they played the Pacers a lot, and then Utah was fucking nuts too. But Reggie Miller was a bad fucking dude, if you don't remember, man. He was Mr. Clutch. I mean, he was Steph Curry before Steph Curry, and I think he was a little better all around player than Steph Curry. But what did you think about the story? Because I liked it that it was pretty cut and dry, it's easy to follow, and we're basically just doing Eastern Conference Finals, NBA Finals. Yeah, this is the first time because the two timelines finally connected that it, it was more like a linear documentary. 
And I think it was cool that we only got that like at the very end of the series. And so that that worked really well for me to kind of bookend everything. Um, one thing that I did like about the story that was kind of interesting was the parallel between uh, and I thought they did focus on him as a character a little too much just because it Ku coach was the like the the whatever the opposite of a beneficiary is because of this. But Steve Kerr's father's death and Jordan's father's death and how Steve Kerr said that he thought Jordan kind of found um, it, it would help him respect him as a competitor. That was a very interesting story too. Steve Kerr's little 10, 15 minute kind of 30 for 30 they had it yeah. and i won't reveal the whole connection but ronnie cycli and his family are very connected to that university and the curse oh, so, oh wow yeah so i've known about that story for a long time but for them to put it here in the the spectrum of like this is a way that kerr and jordan could relate was really interesting but kerr to his own admission like i've seen his interviews after the doc and he's like i cannot believe they use so much of my interview he's like they only did that because i'm the coach of the warriors like I was not that big a part of these teams, to his own admission. No, not really. He was just kind of the guy that could shoot the three. Every team kind of had that guy in the 90s. Um, that guy wasn't the leading scorer most of the time, not like a Steph Curry anymore. But you can really see how Steve Kerr has taken a lot from Phil Jackson's playbook and coaching. Um, definitely a player's coach, kind of a lenient coach. Um, and you can see, I, I know Durant, some of them kind of talked about some of the things he'll say and have certain words that they kind of abide by and stuff like that. But the last thing I'll say about the story, man, is these Utah jazz teams were fucking loaded too. Oh my God, dude. Carl, Carl Malone was a stud. John Stockton is probably the best point guard other than Isaiah Thomas and Magic Johnson ever graced the fucking face of the earth. Howard yeah, Isley second, was yeah. Incredible. Byron Russell, uh, Greg Ostertag. What, what, another thing, too, of all the great centers in the 90s, you had Greg Ostertag, Rick Schmitz, and, like, fucking Luke Longley was the three centers we saw. You didn't see the dream. And that's the, another thing. The Jazz beat that Rockets team because I would have really liked to see that Rockets team against uh, the Bulls, but they beat the Rockets team. But going into Utah would be a tough fucking place to play. One thing I didn't get in all the clips we watched, Jeff Hornacek, who, of course, is my namesake, but how the fuck – they were just abusing him on the post. Like, oh, yeah. Whoever he switched on to would back him down and just dunk on his fucking face and put their balls in his mouth. And they did it like four or five times. Jerry's slow, and I'm like, dude, you can't play this guy <laughs> this series. He's going to get killed. Matt, right. last thing I want to ask you real quick. Sorry, before we move on to best scene. And maybe this is – if this is Are best scene. Are you going to talk about the 93-54 to 54 game that they fucking – in the NBA Finals? No, which is Jerry like a – Sloan was like, like, this is the score? That's like a halftime score now, like, literally. I want to ask you about the conspiracy with Jordan's pizza that he ordered in the flu game. We'll get to that. Okay, if that's your best scene, then let's – perfect It's segue. not my best scene. Well, we'll put on the back burner for just a little bit. We'll get to it. <laughs> we'll do it live. My best scene. Thanks for the uh, segue, Jeff. I've been teasing. You should know my best yeah, scene. Yeah, I know your best scene. I've been teasing this for fucking weeks. <laughs> I wrote in my now, notes. I did I was not like... know how this actually connected, but I do remember, and I said this, I believe, on episode two or three. I said, Rodman and Carl Malone fought in WCW. And I said, I knew it was that Bash of the Beach in July. The NBA Finals are in June. I didn't know Rodman skipped practice to go to a Monday Night Nitro with the NWO, however. So was he and like an honorary NWO member before Bash at the Beach? He was NWO for about, I think, probably six months, let's say, five or six months. They brought him in. Like, this wasn't his first time for the NWO, him missing practice. I know but that. He, he wasn't just a one-time deal. But he was in there a couple practice. days. When he was practice, it wasn't even a pay per view. It was just a Monday Nitro. Monday Nitro, not even a pay per view. <laughs> Jeff. Back in the Christ. day, though, Monday Nitros were fucking huge because they're competing against Monday Night Raw. Anywho. But if I'm Phil, I'm like, for not even a pay per view. It's not even. It's like, He's what like, what the fuck? It's, it's not even Starcade or even one of their lower ones like Bash yeah. at the Beach or like the fucking Spring Stampede they had. But he missed a fucking practice. To go there, and then they set up that. I, I wish they would have set up that Carl Malone actually did it. However, Rich Eisen, he, he's missing practice to put a chair over the head of some guy. Sir, that some guy is Diamond Dallas Page, yeah. three time world heavyweight champion. Show a little he fucking respect. the DDT, right? Wasn't that his move? The Diamond Cutter. Oh, that's right. 
Yeah, which we all use some Basically, iteration of now. Fracture neck. But, <laughs> and I love Rodman's when he goes to, he's like, listen, I just got to do me. Don't we all envy Rodman? Because remember in high school when like we'd make out with another chick and we had a girlfriend, you're like, I just got to do me. Or work, you're just like, listen, I'm drunk, I'm not coming in, I just got to do me. But after a while, you realize, I'm not talented enough to get away with that. So I can't do me. I just, I can't make out with other women. I can't, I can't get drunk and go to work. I can't, you know, just sleep in or, you know, masturbate on an airplane. I can't do me, but Rodman could. And we envy him for it. Every time he'd be like, I mean, he knew that I was going to do what I need to do on the court. I'm like, yeah, but Dennis, all these other guys also do that. But then they also don't just disappear right before the NBA finals. It was a played his ass off though. That's true. And, And don't you love the, this is why this is the best documentary ever. The behind the scenes thing when Phil was talking about it in the huddle and Jordan ke- Jordan kept saying Rodzilla, Rodzilla, like calling him by his wrestling name. I'm like, God, that's so great. Quick story about Rodman, personal story. I was in Vegas uh, last year for the Super Bowl and Rodman was there just doing pictures and shit and everyone was having him sign bullshit. I just went up and did the too sweet sign to him and he kind of looked at me, put down his drink and went too sweet and kissed it. And I was just, and I didn't even, Damn. I would have asked him about that, but he, he How am I not, the NW. You've never told me this story before. What the fuck? Really? Yeah. Yeah. You should have called me the second Vegas that happened. Super Bowl. I have a picture of it. All right. What's your best scene? So mine is just a line and it's just epitomizes Michael Jordan. So when he's on the bus right before, so they talk about how that Pacers series was really draining to them both between travel and like how hard fought the series was. And right before game one against Utah, Jordan's on the bus and he's jamming with his headphones on. And I don't know why this quote stuck with me, but someone's like, what do you listen to? And he goes, I'm listening to Kenny Lattimore. It's brand new. Then puts headphones back on, and then he's like, that wasn't braggadocious enough. Take he's some just off. Like, Not even out yet. He's a friend of mine, so you know. And I said out loud to myself in the room alone, I go, well, no one even knows who the fuck that is. So, <laughs> I literally, I'm glad, because I Googled him right then and played him on Spotify. I'm just like, I, <laughs> Wait, what kind, I mean, I'm not sure <laughs> who that is. What kind of music is it? It's not even because I'm white, because I really like, I especially back then, I loved rap. And I'm like, I I said, I know just his name, Kenny Lattimore. He can't be a rap artist. There's no way. He's, country artist, he's like right? smooth. He's, kinda... he's kind of like boys to men is what I gathered. That was just where I realized like Jordan is like so great that he's operating on some mental level that yeah. I'll never be able to even cut. Because cause I literally said alone. Well, no one knows who the fuck that is, man. So. So of all the great stuff, that was just the scene that stuck out to me. You think Kenny Lattimore is just like, damn, like my Spotify numbers are fucking through the roof right now. You think like Kenny, Kenny Lattimore, it's that Leonardo DiCaprio meme from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood when he hears his name where he points to the TV. Yeah, he's like, oh, <laughs> oh yeah, With his me. beer in his hand. I'm, Ken, that's, I'm Kenny Lattimore. I'm Kenny Lattimore. Kenny that's fucking, fucking Lattimore to you. Let's do another line of Coke. All right, impacts on pop culture. Since you already teased it, I'm going to take it. I'm taking the Jordan, I guess, Dr. Evil parentheses flu game. I also wanted them to bring this up because I'm calling conspiracy theory, Jeff. You know I love my conspiracy theories. And I think it was the flu game, but I just thought they said, hey, Michael, we're going to have to redo the part of this documentary because I don't think people could take it, uh, especially what's going on right now with COVID. And if you thought for a second during that wonder how many people jordan killed with his flu in utah just just don't 2020 my 1997 please let's just enjoy it he fucking he was sick with something for sure i don't know if it was food poisoning i don't know if it was the flu but he played through it and he did great he won the fucking game and that's just (laughs) kind of what the greats did but i i don't believe this what they're feeding me if you get my drift yeah on this so uh, matt i'm glad you brought this up and uh this was not prepped beforehand but i actually found a quote that anonymously the owner of the pizza store that jordan bought that pizza from Mm -hmm. has come out and given to defend himself and he says quote and this is poorly worded (laughs) but this is how he said it quote MJ's trainers could have brought him food from somewhere else if it really was food poisoning. But that pizza was made well, dot, dot, dot. I followed all the rules. I don't know the rules, 
for pizza making. But here's what I would say. Did you see my tweet where it said, these are the guys who brought Jordan his pizza, and it's the five Monstars? Still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so the the pr- problem, I his trainer, when they said five guys brought him the pizza, he's like, I have a bad feeling about this. I'm like, no, if they know it's for Michael Jordan, yeah, the whole fucking, you know, the whole pizza place is going to come. Just try to get a glimpse of Michael. I don't think it was food poison. Sure. I think he had the flu. Also, if you had a bad feeling about it and you let, why is he eating pizza at two in the morning? I mean, there's so many questions I'd raise about that. Regardless, the point of the story is that Jordan was clearly very under the weather. And as someone who like has had the flu and other illnesses, I can't imagine like getting out of bed, let alone playing a basketball game. What's What's interesting to me is not that I don't, I believe that he ate a pizza that late. Have we seen his diet? That one time he said he had a couple beers and smoking a cigar before a game six. Yeah, when you're burning that like, many calories, you're burning yeah, like 5,000 calories a day. It doesn't really. I know, but still smoking cigars kind of, doesn't that hurt with like running and respiratory? I he doesn't think. have a cigar problem. He has an inhaling and okay. puffing yeah, out. Yeah, that's problem. true. But I'm just going to say that they took that out just because I think people would lose their minds since – we came and have fans in the stands for a while, and Jordan basically had the flu and probably killed half the state of Utah with it somehow if you're into that kind of stuff. But I think they switched it. I really did. If not, why has it came out right now? Why have we never heard about this? Why did they just say it's food poisoning? Why I, wouldn't they just say that? Because it's been dubbed the flu game this whole time. I don't know. Also, the other thing is that like you got to save some conspiracies for the end. And it's kind of cool to accuse a pizza shop of – like Celtic priding Michael Jordan before the fucking, NBA yeah, Finals. <laughs> what, what's your impact? So my impact, look, this was a really well-needed documentary series at this time. I've already added it to the Broskers nominations for Best Doc of the Year. Uh-oh. Which, by the way, if you look at that list, it is that is a fucking competition right now. Have you seen this week? Well, that's what I was about to say. So my impact is here's what ESPN is about to fucking drop on us in the next uh, three weeks. Lance, the two-part Lance Armstrong documentary, May 24th and May 31st, which if you see his explanation of what he's about to say, I'm going to give you my version of the truth. Like, oh, great, <laughs> great, Lance. I would love to hear that. You're already guilty. Um, I think I wrote this down wrong. Oh, Be Water, the Bruce Lee documentary, June yep. 7th. And then, of course, Long Gone Summer, June 14th, the Sosa and Maguire that's going to be amazing. And actually, we have a uh, Tiger Grand Slam documentary coming out this Sunday, too. On ESPN or on uh, NBC Golf Channel, which, I mean, a Tiger Woods documentary like this, is he, uh, well, I'll save that. because is, that's I was going to say, is Golf Channel going to can actually go there? I doubt it. But no, no it's, just, it's just the Tiger Slam. It's just the year that he won. It's not the Grand Slam in order, but he won all four major golf tournaments in order. Uh, not really even arguably the greatest golf ever played. Is right. So they're just kind of going Even Ben that. Hogan would be like, no, shut the fuck up. That's the greatest. Yeah. So that's really all I'll say is I think we're living in kind of a glory day for documentaries. And this one does more than its fair share to, to not only el- carry that, but elevate it to another the, level. The, I'll say about impact before I'll move on to our last thing. Um all these people are going to try to do this. I don't think it'll come close to this one because Jordan was just so, this is me, take me or fucking leave me. Even Tiger, who I love, will go bat for his whole life. He's always going to defend his brand. Jordan's like, I'm going to sell shoes no matter what. This is me. If you think I'm a dick, I really don't care because I'm Michael fucking Jordan. Everyone else is going to defend their brand. Lance Armstrong, you think he's going to just, you think he'll be like Michael Jordan in this? Come on. We have to watch that and review it just to fucking laugh at him. I, I mean, I'll watch it because I really know nothing about it. I remember he did Live Strong, which actually I really liked because it gave a lot of money to cancer true. research. Uh, um, I bought a lo- bunch of Live Strong shit. Everyone had a Live Strong bracelet, like, what, 10, 15 years ago? And uh, every anything else, I'm not a cyclist, so I don't really know. Crazy. I know he tests positive. Not to get off on a tangent, he is a cancer survivor and has raised how many millions of dollars for cancer research? Yeah. But he cheated so long and so hard that that is sadly his legacy. As long as Cheryl Crow's in it, you know, talking about it, then yeah, sure, I'll right. watch. All right. Rewatchability is our last one, but I don't want to do that. Fuck that. I'm going to call a, a, a fucking loop de loop. 
what do you want to see like this? Not that's on the docket. What would you like to see like this? And I'll go first since I you didn't know I was going to ask this question because I have two things. It's got to be like this, though, which will be hard with this team. I want one on the 90s Cowboys. Where oh, be so J- good. Jimmy Johnson won two fucking Super Bowls and the year after got fired because him and Jerry couldn't get along. You got Troy, you got the White House, where basically Michael Irvin rented a house in Dallas just so him and his boys could fuck hookers and do Worship coke Christ. and do everything. Yeah. Worship Christ. And then what do you think? Episode five, you got Dion coming in from the 49ers team that you when tried did to they beat. Get you got Charles Troy. Hit. Charles Haley came over that the year before. Charles I think. Haley. You got Troy Aikman, who Skip Bayless was trying to say he was gay the Leon whole time. Lett, like all Leon of this Lett. Shit. You got so much fucking shit there. Emmett Smith, and then you got Jerry going with um, fuck, uh, the guy that coached OU, and then he coached him. He Switzer. won another, Barry Switzer, who won another Super Bowl with him. Then you go to Chan Gailey. I mean, Which that would be a really good. one. Switzer was like the Larry Coker of that. Like all yes. he had to do was just literally yeah, just, not fuck yeah. up. <laughs> it's just don't <laughs> fuck up and you get to win a Super Bowl. But that would be a fantastic one, especially if you had, I mean, but Jerry's so much about his brand, but you had, and Jimmy's, you know, still announcing stuff, but you have Jerry telling his story, Jimmy telling his story. The other one I'll talk about is it'd be almost like the Roman empire. And I want UNLV basketball from about the late seventies to the early nineties and how Tarkanian just basically built that fucking dynasty. It'd be in Vegas. They had Gucci Row with all the actors. They had a ton, they had a ton of top 10 fucking picks with Larry Johnson, Stacey Ogman, Reggie Theus, and basically how the NCAA sanctioned them, tried to get Tark out of there. Like Anything with dirty NCAA basketball, and the reason I'm picking UNLV is because they had such a long run from the late 70s to uh, the early 90s that I think you could do a 10-parter on that. Tarkanian's gone now, which sucks, but I think you could get some dirt on that. I'm not, I, I can't think of right now. Uh, Cal Perry's still in the game, so you couldn't do one on him yet. But those are the two I'd really like to see. Yeah, I, I like both those ideas. And I think the nice thing with the UNLV one, it's almost like the Fab Five, where like once it's has been a certain number of years, these guys are willing to say more because they're not as afraid of the repercussions. Well, every. Every person like, you know, Anderson Hunt, J.R. Ryder, Larry Johnson, none of them are really, I think Johnson still has something to do with the Knicks, but they're not really in the game where they're like, well, I don't want to seem like a dick because I announce games and I'm supposed to be likable. Right. That's what the Cowboys thing I just don't think would work because all of them are announcers doing something like, well, I want to seem likable. I don't want to seem like a dick. Yeah, you need like six whistleblowers. Yeah. Yeah. So my idea is kind of like uh, I can't remember if it's the Brady. Is it the, the Brady six where they talk about the six people drafted before him in the draft or whatever? The Tom quarterbacks, Brady. I mean. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. They go over every quarterback picked ahead of him in, in the 98 draft or whatever. So I want to see one. Uh, but it's about all the competitive teams in the 90s that didn't win championships because of the Bulls. Like the great teams that we yep. got to see in this documentary, case in point, Knicks. my Supersonics, the Knicks, that Pacers team, Suns. the Suns, uh, the who won that Magic? They lost to the Rockets in that finals. Yep. That Magic team, like all the teams that never really got any of the pub and the credit they deserve because they ran into probably the second greatest sports dynasty of all time in the Jordan Bulls. And that Gotti took a year off so we could get that Rockets Magic finals. Yep. But there, you and I were talking about this, I think, two reviews ago, episode seven and eight. There is a cavalcade of incredible 90s basketball teams oh, yeah. that, like, Charles Barkley gets shit on by Draymond Green because he didn't win a title. Draymond, shut the yeah, fuck like, up. Dude, like, yeah. It's like apples like to oranges. the fifth best player on the team that won the title. Yeah, like, what um, happened now when you didn't have Steph and Clay? You guys won 14 games. You have the yeah. number one pick. So shut the hell up. I think that would be cool because those are teams that have incredible talent, and I love late 90s NBA ba- – mid to late 90s NBA basketball. But that would that just be – Hornets team with Larry Johnson who actually – I think it was 94, 95. He was the $82 million man. He was the number one paid player in basketball with Alonzo Mourning, Kendall Gill, Muggsy Bogues. And they actually took uh, – they took the Bulls to, I think, game six or seven, and Muggsy missed a baseline jumper to win it. I mean, there's a bunch of teams out there. There that was a, a Kings team before the early 2000s team, that team with Mitch Richmond, Olden yep. Uh They had a couple other really good players. 
I can't remember. But, I mean, there's just some great teams that never get talked about. It'd be Lakers cool to, like— Lakers with Nick the Quick Man, Exel, Vladi Divac, Cedric Sabalas. Eddie I mean, Jones. Eddie Jones. They had a great team. Yeah. So, I think there's a lot of great 90s basketball players and teams that are never—and rightfully so. They weren't champions. But it'd be, like, the best, the, the best of the rest or something they could call yeah. it. I love it. All right, guys, we've been the Bro4 Squad. That is our complete review on The Last Dance. If you'd like to like us do more sports shit, comment below. Let us know. We might try to dip our toe in the Lance Armstrong one because that could be maybe quite funny. Uh, we have a website, Bro4Squad.com, iTunes, YouTube, Yankers, where you can find all of our shit. So subscribe to us on there. Twitter, at Bro4Squad. And you can check out all our reviews on Letterboxd. Until then, I'm Matt. He's Jeff. Everyone else, I think, is wrestling with Hulk Hogan or something. So their absence isn't excused, though. And you're the only one that is worried about Banner it. Banner said he just has to do him. and you. He said you would understand. I got to do me. I'm just Rob. I just want to fuck chicks and do drugs. Oh, like, but Dennis, we, like, you're paid to play basketball.